Good evening, everyone. I'm Amy Kerwin. I'm the Artistic Director of Southampton Arts Center. Thank you all for joining us this evening for uh, another sure to be uh, fascinating and enjoyable conversation with some of the artists of 2020 Vision, as well as uh, Bernard Lumpkin, who's a collector and uh, a essayist for the show as well. Um, so I just, again, want to thank our partners at New York Academy of Art for um, uh, putting on this show with us, along with Stephanie Roach, David Kratz, the curator, Stephanie Roach, the co-curator, and the Gilby Keller, the, S the uh, editor. Uh, it's been a wonderful experience. We love working with the New York Academy of Art, and the show is on view through December 27th, so you have plenty of time to come see it many, many times. Um, galleries are open Thursday to Sunday, 12 to 5 p.m., so please do come visit us. And save the date for November 12th at 6 p.m. Eastern for the next panel discussion, which is Documenting Crises in Real Time, uh, moderated by Clifford Owens with Steve Mumford and Pamela Zeibel and uh, Clifford as well. And so that's going to be another uh, great evening. So please do save the date for November 12th at 6 p.m. Eastern. Uh, I will be moderating, sorry, I will be keeping track of the Q&A and the chat field. So if you have questions, please ask them. Um, and we'll take those questions at the end, as many as we can get to. We apologize to those we don't get to, but we'll do our best. Um, so that's enough for me. Um, do check out SouthamptonArtsCenter.org and, and come see us. And now I'm going to bring in New York Academy of Art President, David Kratz. David. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, uh, one thing Amy didn't notice is that I am also uh, an alum of the New York Academy of Art. So I know the school super well. And just uh, briefly, the, the New York Academy of Art is a graduate school down in Tribeca. We study painting, drawing, and sculpture. And our mission is to give artists the skills and techniques that they need to make vital contemporary art. The school is focused mostly on figurative art in the belief that everything you need to know, you can learn by study of the, of the body and of representing the body. And then you can take that and do anything you want with it as you go forward. And one of the great things about figurative art is that it often is used to tell the stories of our times. And that is a perfect um, sort of lead into this show, 2020 Vision. Um, first, I'll say 2020 Vision was, is our third collaboration with the Southampton Arts Center. And I just want to give a big shout out and thank you to them. They really make dreams come true. And um, we have had uh, so much fun and it's been so kind of richly rewarding experience working with them. Um, my co-curator Stephanie Roach and I uh, had, a, had a mission here to um, put together a show that responded to the times. And mostly it was about the two events that happened during 2020 that sort of took everybody by surprise and, and completely rocked our world. Um, obviously the coronavirus pandemic and the social justice awakening. And we had um, a, a really great, great time kind of mining each of our respective networks to find artists who would be witnesses and uh, you know, antenna of, uh, of how these events were changing the world and how they were responding to these, these times. One of the great things about this show is that um, in addition to visual artists, we included um, uh, text pieces, so written pieces, um, and having artists and writers together. Here's an example on the screen right now. We, we used poll quotes from the written pieces. Um, they're all taken from from much longer pieces of writing or poetry or um, you know various various things um, to interplay with the images in order that we would end up with a multi multifaceted view of the the, the situation. Um, now it gives me a lot of pleasure to introduce my co-curator Stephanie Roach, who is also a dear friend, and she is. Um, the director of the Flag Art Foundation, Stephanie. 
Thank you, David. I'm Stephanie Roach, the director of the Flag Art Foundation, where I am currently seated. Um, and we just opened a show of AWOL Arisku, um, and it will be on view through mid-November. I just want to say that in addition to what David had said about 2020 vision, one of the most rewarding and meaningful parts of this whole process was working very closely with the artists. And like many of us, I mean, we, we were all in quarantine as were they. So the communications that we had with the artists during this time, um, the planning process was really important. And I want to give a brief introduction to the three artists that we're going to be hearing from tonight uh, before I hand it back over to David to introduce Bernard. One of the commonalities that I saw with these three artists that I think is pretty striking is that they are all self-taught. And I think that will inform a very interesting conversation with Bernard. So Tani Chapman um, is an artist that primarily works um, with uh, digitally altered photographic portraits. And so she primarily worked in photograph, but then had started to move toward um, combining traditional portraiture with digital collage, layering elements of antique patterns, digital, uh, vintage botanicals, and wildlife illustrations. And in the work that she has in our current show, um, Eden's Play Dress, this has layers of gold leaf and paint inspired by Klimt. Uh, she won first place in 2018 in the International Photo Awards for the Awakening. And she had a solo exhibition in 2019 at Photographska uh, in New York. Taha Clayton, he is based in Brooklyn. And he, um, I think this sums up his work quite well. He brings together social and political issues, uh, spiritual virtues, and above all, the portraits are painted with a universal love that is seen through his technical abilities and poetic compositions. So we'll be hearing more about that. Um, and then Justin Wadlington, who I actually met through the founder of FLAG, Glenn Furman, and we included him in an exhibition uh, in 2019 called Drawn Together and featured his work. And over the, the past few years, we've really gotten to know each other. Um, Justin is blind in one eye, which makes his story really compelling. And he also, um, he's a painter and a draftsman. He works in a more photorealistic um, style, and he has portrayed different icons such as Jay-Z, Nas, Notorious B.I.G., and Eze, as well as different art historical references. And I just want to draw um, the relationship back to the Academy because actually in the show that Justin was featured, um, we had an open call with the New York Academy of Art, which made it a really special occasion. So I'll turn it back over to David, who will introduce Bernard. David, you're muted. Thank you. I just want to say I miss seeing you on a daily basis when we were working together to put this, put this show on. And um, it really exceeded my expectations. And, it's great to see you on the on at least virtually right now. Um, you know, one of the greatest things about doing a show like this is the people that it brings you into contact with. And um, one of my favorites in this particular case has been our moderator, Bernard Lumpkin. And uh, before I turn it over to him for the rest of the panel, I want to tell you why he was exactly the right choice to moderate this panel. He's a um, art collector a patron, an educator, a curator, and he focuses on emerging and established artists of African descent um, as part of a, mis a mission of, a broader mission of institutional advocacy and support. Um, he's on the board of trustees at the Studio Museum. He's on the board of trustees at the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture. He's on a couple important committees at um, some little known institutions like the Museum of Modern Art and uh, the Whitney. And um, as if all of that wasn't enough, he um, put together uh, an incredible show that is, I believe, still currently traveling um, based on uh, 
he, he and uh, his husband's family collection. It's called Young, Gifted, and Black. And um, uh, it's, uh, I just said that the book just came out and it's really uh, a beautiful, important show. Um, but most importantly of all, he's a contributing artist to this show. Um, Bernard did a great uh, essay, one of my favorites, in fact, that sort of offered three perspectives on life in lockdown. Um, one, dealing with his children. Two, dealing with uh, the artists that he's in daily contact with. And three, um, centering on the, the protests. And the way he knitted them all together was, um, was really beautiful. I encourage you to read it. Um, and with that, Bernard, I'd love to turn it over to you. Take it away. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, David, for those kind words. Um, you know, I just need to say how grateful I am to have been um, part of the magic of this project. I mean, really, uh, when David first called me quickly, just to say a few words, when David first called me, he was exactly, as he explained in, in his introductory remarks, it was the beginning of the um, pandemic. And the show was taking shape. And then over the course of our conversation, George Floyd happened. And we were dealing with a whole different set of, uh, a whole different reality. And actually, a reality which became another opportunity for this exhibition, um, which I think David and Stephanie um, shepherded so um, with so much grace and so much thoughtfulness. And all I can say is I'm a lot of gratitude for thinking of including me, for giving me an opportunity to reflect on these issues as many of us in the art world have. Um, you know, I can't describe how amazing it was for me to see my words on the wall next to some of my favorite artists uh, when I went to the Southampton Art Center for the opening of the exhibition, which was also a first in terms of uh, my first sort of post-pandemic re-entry into the art world. So that was really amazing to reconnect with um, artists, to see work in person again. Um, it really was inspiring. Um, you know, some of the artists that I recognized in the exhibition were artists that I already knew very well, but I also got the pleasure of sharing wall space with some new artists. And as someone who focuses on emerging artists and new voices, uh, Young, Gifted and Black is the name of the book. We, uh, for me, it was really special to learn about, to discover, and to, and to tonight share the, uh, share the stage with three other artists from the exhibition whom I, whose work I was not previously very familiar with. And so I'm also just expressing gratitude for giving me the opportunity to continue to learn and to grow and to challenge myself um, in this period. So just a big thank you. And I think as, as Stephanie said so well, that this show, what's amazing about it is that it really is, I think Stephanie, you said this in another panel, a live document of the period. And you know, we're still in that period. And so the document, which is this exhibition, is still living. And I think Tani and Taha and Justin are really privileged to share with us this evening their perspective, speaking to, responding to, the times that we are living through, and as all artists do, showing us the way forward, showing us the future before we even know what we're looking at. So again, a big thank you, and I will now turn to the artists in question. I'll start um, with you, Tawny. So, you know, I'm gonna say for each of you, and I wish I had more time, and, and I would if I could, but for each of you, I'd like to say, you know, something that I responded to in the work that really struck me or touched me and then ask you a question about the work too. Um, so what I, what I really loved about your photography, which is really interesting because it's photography and then so much more, but starting first as a photographer, you know, there's something very personal and also universal in your work. And your photographs are drawn from, um, portraits of people you know, your family, your children. And I think, you know, when you're talking about, you know, when you have a photograph of a child, a black child, you know, you're talking about your own family, but you're also talking about all black children. And for someone looking at your photographs like myself, 
you're giving us an opportunity to see ourselves in your work. And I thought that was very powerful. So that balance between the personal and the universal. Um, as Stephanie pointed out just now in her introduction, a really amazing thing that you do with these photographs is that you embellish them and you, you add elements collage-like, um, whether it's paint, whether it's gold leaf. Um, and I was wondering if you would just share with us a little more about that process, sort of starting with the photograph and then what you do to take that photograph to a different place through your work. Okay, so I don't know if we wanted to talk about the photo we're on or move to another so that we can um, maybe so Eden's play Eden's play yeah like Eden's play dress in the exhibition um, okay, wonderful so, yeah <laughs> so um, Eden's play dress is from my series the redemption um, and this started as a, a photograph and this series um, is my response to um, uh, constantly hearing of beautiful black children being sent home um, from school because of their hairstyles um, and, and their natural hair. These are natural hairstyles that we wear in black culture and uh, kids are constantly being discriminated against in um, the school systems and unable to wear their hair in these styles. And so I um, started off with a portrait of Eden. Um, and from that portrait, I uh, brought it into Photoshop and um, I photographed her in a white dress. And so I wanted to be able to paint her dress on my own. So I took that dress out in Photoshop and then I, uh, after having it printed, I was able to paint in gold leaf and add all of the additional touches um, once the piece was printed. Is, the, um, is the, the paint in the gold leaf, I mean, there's been a reference to the work, which is um, to, you know, Gustav Klimt, I think familiar to many viewers. Were, were you sort of thinking about a specific, I mean, aside from Klimt and European painting tradition, were you thinking of other traditions perhaps? or um, For me, uh, of course, um, gold historically through art uh, was reserved for people of importance um, in religious iconography and Byzantine uh, art. Um, and Klimt, of course, I definitely wanted the connection to be made immediately. Um, the feeling that his work gave me um, when I first laid eyes on it was definitely the same feeling that I wanted to evoke in the viewer of my work. That's great. That's great. Can we, can we look at another, um, maybe another image? Okay. The Redemption, St. Michael George III. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Beautiful, a beautiful, um, would you still call them collages? Is that what you would say or a photograph with? Honestly, um, I call them messages. I really don't even know <laughs> what to refer to the work as. Um, a lot of the work and while I'm working, I am thinking of someone, something, something that has happened that has um, forced me to do the work. and. And basically, when I'm unable to say what I want to say, I'm able to do this through my work. And so this piece, um, it's titled St. Michael George Trey, is really what the three stands for, but the third um, okay. is dedicated to three boys. Um, and before the work belonged in the collection, I didn't really mention the inspiration um, behind the work, but there are so many different layers. Um, his eyes, I have used the eyes of um, George Stinney, who is the youngest um, person to be uh, executed in the United States. He was a 14 year old boy. He was wrongfully accused. So those are his eyes that I've used on my nephew. Um, and uh, Michael is in reference to Mike Brown and Trey is for Trayvon Martin. And so, yeah, there, there's so many different messages and so many different meanings uh, uh, <laughs> embedded in the work. That's great, that's great. Um, and I guess, uh, Tani, would you like to say anything in terms of 
um, the, you know, the sort of, the way you feel sort of being a part of this exhibition, I guess I would say, and maybe with reference to Justin or Taha's work in terms of, you know, how you see your work in this moment in an exhibition talking about these issues and in dialogue with other artists. What does that mean to you? Like, how do you see that? Um, the thing is, I think that our work will always be relevant. A, a lot of the time um, people use the, the word that it's relevant right now, but it's always relevant. Um, and um, I think that we're saying similar things through, throughout our work. And, it, and Eden's play dress was created in 2019 um, before the exhibition, um, but it still has relevance and it, it will um, because through COVID and through everything that's happened, so much has been revealed still. Um, I, I believe that uh, majority of the teenagers and children that have been killed uh, by COVID have been black and Hispanic. So it reveals so much that uh, racism and discrimination is, exists. Um, and to me, that's what COVID has also done. Great. Okay, Tani, thank you. So hold some of those thoughts uh, for the end when we'll all we'll sort of have a more of a group conversation. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I um, was hoping now to turn it to Taha. And if Taha is there, I don't see you. Um, but okay. Um, Let's see. I'm just looking to see if Taha, you're coming up. Um, I don't see. Hey, there you are. Hey, 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 hey. Good to see. You. Good to see you, Taha. Great to see you. Okay. Um, beautiful eco spirituality. What a great title. Okay. So from photography to uh, with Tani to photorealism, which I think is such an amazing uh, genre of art, and it sort of speaks for itself. We're talking about paintings that have a certain sort of verisimilitude that mimics that of photographs. Uh, it may also hint at the process of your work, uh, which I'm going to ask you about. Do you start with photographs? Do you reference photographs? Um, and then I also, uh, another thing that I really was drawn to in the work is just the, the sort of layering here, which happens. And I think that's both a compositional comment. In other words, there's layering in this, um, in the work in front of us right now, eco-spirituality in terms of a uh, figure in the foreground, uh, detailed patterning on the figure's uh, you know, clothing, and then the play of shadows in the background on the, um, on the surface of the, on the side of the building. Uh, really fascinating and really pleasing to the eye and also um, really draws the viewer in, both I think conceptually and also um, in terms of, uh, you know, how is this made kind of, I never think it's that with my children, I'm always reminded of like the basic thing with art, which is what are we looking at and how do we describe it? What are we seeing? What's happening? And I think that um, sometimes we forget about those basic questions. Sometimes those basic questions are very, uh, get you to the heart of, of the work. So I love all of that happening in your work. Um, maybe you just want to talk a little bit about this uh, eco-spirituality um, uh, before we, before I go, I, I go any further. And also just a reminder to the audience, please uh, don't hesitate to type in your questions in the chat as we go. We will get to as many of them at the end of the program as we can. So go ahead, Taha, tell us more about eco-spirituality. <laughs> okay, there's a lot there, but um, so I, 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 I do shoot. I do shoot reference photos. Um, so I'll go out, shoot some stuff and put things together sometimes, kind of collage it up and, and create pieces. Or it could just be, a, you know, focusing on one individual person, a portrait. Um, with eco-spirituality, that one is about one's connection with their environment. So it's like, is the environment a reflection of you or are you a reflection of the environment? So that's where... Like you, you'd seen the, the, the shadow in the back and, and the fatigue and these things, right. it's kind of, you know, they start mirroring each other. 
and it's going into layers of um is our community a reflection of us our anger our frustration our fears um or are we in are we a product of our community are we you know are we into something based off of the times or the times reflection of us you know so that was kind of the theme going into it this one it, with him i tried to create a balance um and it's a being that is a part of it a part of the community and um manifesting the, the his environment and also being a, a product of the environment whether the product in the sense of um or a reflection of the environment like the trees the leaves and it's showing in the clothing you know um the facial tattoos the 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 metal work and just different things of 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 kind of um his full surroundings he's he is a part of that and you know that is a part of him um so that was kind of the intention um and again that's how i kind of i go about it shooting and i'll go and kind of set up shoot some things and then and then create the painting so the concept there's a concept there i'll go out and try and you know create that piece are the this is another beautiful uh, painting divine connection which again i think speaks to what your your concept of the relationship between you know people and their environment um <clears throat> are the figures uh that you photograph or, the, or that you portray are they real are they imagined um what's the relationship between you and the subjects in the works um, the generally, like I come in contact with people, so it might be um, with divine connection. That's that's a friend um, where I'm witnessing um, fatherhood. I'm I'm a father as well too, and a husband. Um, but stepping outside of myself, seeing my environment, seeing my community, this was something I wanted to grasp of that universal that 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 circle you know the divine of 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 father and child whether female whether male but just that cycle and that presence um so it is about that being but it's beyond the being it's it's kind of just um it's a universal thing of, of father and child and uh trying to focus on the simplest things of, of just touch you know there's always things like going to the game or doing this and you know just these kind of actions but just the simplest of touches um passes energy off and so that's where the the divine connection is father and child but it's also this whole universal thing with whether the creator or energy or community and just kind of everyone being a part of that so that's kind of um that's you know that, that sure thing. Great. Um, in the last the panel, I'm sorry, the one metamorphosis. Um, yeah. It's some. It's different from the other works in that it's not sort of set in a recognizable, um, you know, urban or a familiar sort of physical or real world setting. It almost has a sort of ethereal or otherworldly um, sort of vibe. Uh, can you just say a little bit more about this painting in relationship to the others? Yeah, this one is, is specifically about like um, transformation, chrysalis shedding of a skin, shedding of a, a perspective, a mind state, you know, social construct. So it was spe it's specific to um, where the other ones, again, it's about them a part of the community. Um, this one's more internal. Um, and so it's dealing with um, focusing with this specific um, being here. It's there's a lot of pressure and structure things on females and especially young black females of like noses and lips and hair and what's right and what's wrong. And, and so this was about shedding all those, you know, um, perspectives, shedding all that judgment, shedding all that and going into the meta, the true love of self going into the Buddhist. So it's metamorphosis, the transformation into um, self acknowledgement, just understanding the divine um, so they generally still move within this energy of kind of universal love and um, spirituality and things like that. But this one was more focused on, that was more focused on the young lady and shedding the chrysalis, the cocoon and kind of evolving as the butterfly. Great. Okay. 
Excellent. Um, maybe that'll give us something to think about. Just I'm thinking about what you said just now about um, sort of representations of the black female um, in popular culture or in painting, thinking about what Tawny said at the beginning in terms of um, hair. And uh, I'm hoping, Tawny, that you're listening and that maybe we can go back in the group chat part of this to talk a little bit further about that, just images of, of images of and notions of black beauty um, and how the black body is represented in, in visual culture, particularly from the standpoint of um, the maker of those images uh, who controls the way black bodies are represented and how they're represented. Um, which I think is another amazing thing, which each of the each of you are doing in your work in this exhibition is putting forth a different view of uh, the black body than what most people are accustomed to seeing. Um, and I think that's very important. I just wanted to get a little bit uh, deeper on that in a, in a minute. Um, so, uh, and Taha, we'll come back. Is this, my only question about this painting was, is it a self-portrait? <laughs> no, no, actually this is the same gentleman that's in the eco-spirituality. Ah, okay, great. Sage, uh, so yeah. Okay, got it. Um, and that person is a real person, but someone who to you represents fatherhood, um, uh, manhood in some more universal way? This, this. Yeah, so not fatherhood, yes, he's a father, but he's not in the divine connection, the eco-spirituality, the e one eco spirituality. community. And, uh, but yes, it's, 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 it's about energy, sage. So he being a sage, it could be looked at as a sage, um, wise energy passing off that spirit, but then also burning the sage, which is cleansing the space. So it's, it's putting out that energy of kind of like um, beings that I would like to kind of put out there to represent, you know, to rep um, be represented, that it's a clean energy. Um, love of self, um, blessing each other, passing positive energy on. So putting out that vibration. So the piece is about vibration and cleansing, you know, cleansing right. uh, the spirits and all that kind of. Great, stuff. great. Okay, hold that thought, Taha. Yeah, um, yeah. Hold those thoughts. Um, so uh, the, the third artist uh, that we are um, featuring this evening, Justin Waddlington. Uh, Justin, good to see you again. How you doing? We had the pleasure of meeting uh, at the show at the opening. Very happy about that. Um, and I think Justin, you know, I wanted to, you know, I think uh, Tawny's work, you know, she's showing us images of families, of uh, mothers and daughters, of um, sort of real, the real, the black family today. I think Taha is also talking about, um, you know, in terms of what he says about the relationship between um, individuals and their environment, uh, black fathers, the community. Um, I think that's also very, it's sort of a, a larger extension of this theme of how we are representing black life, black bodies, the black experience. Um, and I think your work is also an interesting angle on that theme which is sort of, for me, you know, these are like hero portraits. Um, you know, these are, these are heroes, and <clears throat> heroes and heroism, and the way that you paint them also lends to that. Um, you know, Tawny adds gold leaf to her photographs, which is beautiful, and the point she made about how gold throughout culture um, has always been associated with elevated figures, kings, um, the divine, and you also, with the beautiful, I mean, I'm just looking first, and I remember seeing this in person, the frame that you um, I frequently use for your paintings are very um, elaborate, beautiful frames, uh, which, you know, a frame literally is what holds the painting, but it's also a frame of reference for the audience. It also tells us or gives us a clue as to how we should be perceiving the work and what the meaning of the work is. Um, you know, before I was working uh, as an educator and a patron, I was working at MTV. And so thankfully, I knew a little bit about the legends here that uh, in this beautiful painting, the apotheosis of, of legends, um, and about death sort of happening in different ways. Um, you know, it was funny because at MTV is where I 
you know, I watched, so I got to work on shows that had to do with sort of social issues and education and politics. I worked on the PBS part of MTV um, and also documentaries and news. And one of the projects that I worked on was a series of reports on the unsolved, the then unsolved murder of Jam Master J. Uh, so I think that was an early introduction for me of hip hop culture. I think, you know, hip hop culture is something which is familiar to many people. What struck me so much about your work and this painting in particular is that you're taking these, you know, again, these are, in my view, heroes, legendary figures, uh, and you're sort of taking them out of the context that much of the culture, the general culture sees them in and elevating them. Um, or, you know, I can say elevating, but I should really leave that to you to explain how you are changing them by the way you portray these figures. Uh, I think that's very, um, I think that's very interesting. And I feel like it's part of the story here, which each of you is telling in terms of how we represent the Black experience. Um, so Justin, with that quick introduction, do you want to say a little bit more about sort of how you go about, um, you know, why you choose the figures that you choose and what you do to uh, re-render them in a way that people recognize, but that is also new and different and challenging, perhaps? Yes, yes. Uh, first of all, thank you uh, to everybody that was involved in this uh, panel. Uh, it's, a, it's an honor to be here. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, happy to be here. So I wanted to say that, first of all. Um, to answer your question, uh, you're right about uh, painting to, to portray elevation um, within uh, a certain image of people in the Black culture, I guess you would say. Um, when I was younger, I used to always walk into museums and things like that and and be fascinated with all the paintings of like heroes and uh, events from you know the the early times, like before there were uh, cameras. And rarely do you ever see uh, African Americans in these pictures. And I'm looking like you know I'm growing up and and uh, you know you guys were talking about like fatherhood and uh, my dad actually passed away when I was two, so. Uh, like it wasn't even somebody like that that I could look up to when I was uh, younger. So when I would go out and I would look around, the closest thing to me were, you know, of course, uncles or people out on the street or uh, hip hop artists or anything like that. And uh, that's kind of what I attached to, you know. So as I got older, um, just in my head, I always said that one day, like, I want to be able to paint something like that, like looking at any of those museums. I said, one day I'm going to be able to paint something like that, but this time I'm going to represent it with people that I see all the time, you know what I mean, growing up. So that, that's, that's a, a major um, factor in why I choose all of these icons um, and people like that. It's because, uh, you know, they, they resonated with me. They were in some instances, father figures to me and things like that. So, um, yeah, um, <laughs> I, could I could explain a little bit about the apotheosis. That actually, apotheosis actually means to ascend to a higher uh, elevated level. So all those, those guys who were fathers who passed away early, um, they left a, a mark on all, like, all, entire culture, like Easy e from Nipsey, that's about three generations worth of uh, artists in one painting. So it's like it, from the 80s to the 2000s, people can look at that painting and see a moment somewhere in there. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. I wanted to portray those guys, um, even though they all passed away, even though they were murdered, you know, uh, I wanted to leave the image of them as if they were still alive and you, they were still somewhere um, full of life, full of color, um, and just at a, a elevated level. So that explains it. That's great. Um, can you go, just keep that thought on, in, um, hold on to that thought, go to the next painting, uh, the, the one after this one actually, uh, in terms of what you're saying, yes, which is really great because it's, um, you know, it's a painting of a painting, it's an artist's 
you know, you're an artist's artist, I see, and we can all look and recognize uh, familiar, our own art, artistic heroes there with uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat. Uh, I see Simone Lee, who is representing uh, the United States, the next Venice Biennale. Yeah. Got to give it up for Simone. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, can you just say a little bit more about this painting? There's a lot going on, and I'm curious to know what, what you were thinking when you made this. Yeah, this one's called the Black, well, it's actually called Bad. So it's like a lot of things that I do are like metaphorical. Um, I don't want everything to be uh, just right out straight, you know what I mean? I want it to have a deeper meaning behind it. So when you look at the word bad, it has many meanings, but it actually stands for Black American Dream. And, uh, you know, I grew up listening to Jay-Z <laughs> forever. So he, he became, a, you know, a, a big inspiration to me. Um, just always kept me motivated when I saw his work ethic over the years. It just was like every single year since he first was introduced to hip hop, he dropped a great album. It wasn't just like he got, uh, you know, super successful and then fell off. He was like always at the top of his, his game and still is. And, uh, you know, I learned, I learned Basquiat through Jay-Z. Like I learned who he was through Jay-Z. I learned, um, a lot about, uh, it made me appreciate what I was doing even more with, with the art, you know, seeing like my, a guy that I, I look up to, you know, um, bragging about art on his walls and things like that. So I wanted to make this painting uh, to symbolize a lot of black artists such as Basquiat, such as Jay-Z. I have like Beyonce on the, uh, a Nike, the Nike statue that's in uh, the Louvre. I have her face on there. And then there's like even like a family aspect that's hidden in there because the leaves represent Blue Ivy, which is the daughter. The right. helmet represents like Sir, which is their son. And then even Rumi is there with a, a quote from the poet Rumi. And that's another one of their kids. So it's just this like melting pot of all these like metaphorical things and, and homage to a lot of black artists that I grew up with. That's great. That's great, Justin. Um, I wonder whether like now it would be wonderful to hear uh, just as you've been watching Tawny and um, Taha uh, what, and we can continue looking at um, some more paintings by Justin, which I see are referencing art history and also, uh, you know, black representation, representation of black bodies. Um, Tawny, do you have any questions based on sort of what we've been talking about I know we started with you and we started talking about family and photo you know the move from photography to um as you say messages which I think is such a beautiful way to think about your work uh anything that we've said since we started talking that you sort of want to comment on or maybe you have a question for Justin or Taha based on their on their work I have a question. I'm more so because I too use gold frames. So I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at his frames and wondering where you got some of them, but I don't know. <laughs> I'll let you know. A A B O art. That's where I get them. <laughs> I don't necessarily have any questions that I can think of right now. I'm looking behind you. I just realized now that you're full screen, I can see the yeah. gold frame. <laughs> frames are Lots frames take. Questions. Frames take everything up a, a whole nother level. Like just you, you, once again, growing up in the museums and I was like, man, when I can afford it, I'm going to start getting <laughs> frames for my artwork. And I agree with you that one thing that I do is I source frames also from some of them are contemporary and some of them are antique. So I also source them from private sellers and, and things like that. But one thing that I've noticed is that um, sellers place a lot of value on the frame. Um, one woman, she told me, be, be careful with that, you know, don't, don't handle it. And, and, and this is what I'm saying through my work, you know, uh, the world values things more than they're valuing the lives of the people that I'm placing in, in the work. So I, I love the frames that you use, of, of course. So that was my main comment on that. It it's definitely takes like a me and my guy who helps me pick the frames. It's definitely like research and like yeah. you know a whole thing behind it. So yeah, I, I appreciate you uh, <laughs> listening. <to> that. Thank. 
That's great. Taha, what do you think of when you, this is an interesting conversation about frames, which I wasn't expecting, but it's, it's really great because you don't, you know, <clears throat> it's easy not to think about the frame and you guys are, um, you know, Tani and uh, Justin are sort of making us think about the frame and what it can add to a work of art. Uh, Todd, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, like I'm all in. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm a, my background prior is a builder. So I'm a carpenter. So I build my, pa I build panels. So I'm painting on panels and I'll build them. But I also would build my frames. Um, so I was actually, I got up to go grab because I got some gold frames over there. Oh, <laughs> so, but then it goes back to the thing of talking about gold earlier, we're talking about it. You can go back to like Mensa Musa, you can go back to Timbuktu, you can talk yeah. about gold, and you can talk about that, which, you know, people of the sun, gold. And so I'm, I'm all for, for um, the gold aspect and with the framing. Um, and I, and I, I, like, I've done wallpaper frames. I'm like a wallpaper guy. So it's like bringing that, it's just another element that you can kind of take the piece up or add it. Just another element, a little kind of. And it doesn't always little, have to be gold either. It can be yeah, that's, whatever, yeah. That's where I'm saying like I, the wallpaper, I've done, you know, walnut frames, so on and so forth, but just to add to the, to the gold. I'm like, I find in this conversation and, and amongst the community, there's a lot of similarities just in, representation, um, showing that regal, that class, that culture that has always existed, um, combining whether it's photo and paint and this, which breaks down to like jazz or things where it's taking certain things and creating something. So I find in what you know, my fellow artists here, it's, it's, it's kind of pulling and that's that hip hop, the modern day, you know, taking a little this, taking a little that, adding this, adding that. Um, so I just, I kind of find in these conversations to find that similarity that everyone wants to show and show what a people have been and, and give, give a, a, you know, a visual to that, um, which it's, it's been highlighted by only a certain, generally a certain community. And it's just, a lot of people have always been a part of it, but uh, it's just exactly. kind of, people are starting to peep, peep what's happening, you know? You can't hide, you can't hide it no more. I feel like it was like almost seemingly like it was hidden for, a long time because I'm like it ain't no way uh black African American artists just started getting like this good. Like I feel like it's always been that way, but everywhere you look you don't really see that. So I'm I'm glad that the internet and social media and things like that allowed you know somebody that might not be able to afford to get into a gallery to post all their artwork on their page and get somebody from you know a different um environment or whatever like that to see that work so I, I definitely um i'm just i'm I'm happy for the times that we're in because it, it's definitely opening the doors and giving opportunities to a lot of people who might have been like lost in history without like this technology so hooray for the future <laughs> to, to, add, to add add one thing is like you know when we look at sculpture you look at painting we generally go to like europe you know, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Caravaggio. That's what got me painting. Just like, I was like, man, I love that, that war, that, you know, and even his story, dude was hardcore, you know, but we want to talk about sculpture. Let's learn about who, you know, who, let's go to ancient Egyptian. You know, we can talk about sculpture and realism. That was there. We can go to Western Africa. We can talk about abstract and just creation and connection. So it's right. been there, but it was looked at, you know, we just tend to, um, we tend to talk about just the European perspective, yet the Greeks and Romans who were learning from, you know, what was going on in Africa. So it's, it's kind of claiming, and again, not, not running to people to go kind of give us a light, come on, help it, let us get in the game. It's just like, forget it, let's own it, let's represent it, let's build our community. Yeah. Um, let's, let's just be our representation, you know, let's just keep together. And that's, I think, technology is definitely allowed to kind of jump over the key holders to some extent, you know? Um, and let people know what again has been going on since since the jump. Most yeah. definitely. And to add to that, and to also add to to something that Justin mentioned, um, on top of the the frustrations um, of everything happening in the world, I began to notice with my children taking them to museums. You know, you don't see yourselves; they're not seeing themselves, and that is very important. It's very important for 
us to see ourselves and these big gold frames and this massive, you know, way. And so I found myself complaining and complaining and crying and being very frustrated about it. And so that's a, also a big thing that catapulted me into creating more of what, it, what I wanted to see. There are m millions of amazing black artists in the world. Um, but for me, I, I more so was feeling, um, what are you doing to contribute to the world that you want your children to, to grow up in? What are you doing to contribute to um, creating these things that you want them to see in other black children? Because this, this was very, it's, it's very important, um, basically to speak the truth. These things are true that we're saying. And we've been placed in the background. And, and, and growing up in Western culture, that's just what has happened. We, we weren't able to see ourselves in this way. And so we're all playing our own role in, in shifting the narrative even more um, and, and creating what we want to see. And that's what I'm finding here. Mm -hmm, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, definitely, uh, it's definitely powerful. I agree, once again, because when I, I, I actually gave up on art, for six years back in uh maybe right after uh i did like a semester at a community college and, and then after that i kind of uh after that i kind of like gave up a kind of a lot of a lot of tragic things happened or whatever but uh one day i'm a couple six years seven years later i'm i, I said you know what like you said uh, i said what am i going to do like i'm kind of walking around like being feeling miserable about myself and i was like you know what i'm i think that art, like I felt like it calling me, get, get back into art. And one of the things that really, really helped me was, like I said, again, social media, somebody actually on Facebook sent me a link to a, a black artist out in London. Uh, you might have heard of him, like Kelvin Ogrefer. And at this time, he actually I sent them a message like, hey, how'd you draw? Because I was like, at first I saw these these drawings. I'm like, there's no way a person did this. Like, it's so good. And that like made me automatically energized, like <laughs> that I could actually take it my own self up to another level. And he actually like replied to me and gave me some pointers and things like that. So the power in art and just like you said, representation, seeing somebody that like you, it, it really, it, it, I can vouch for that like 100% that it can change somebody's trajectory in their life for sure yeah, yeah. just a, just a quick little thing you can look at the opposite of that and you could say seeing people slinging people fighting people shooting people killing and that representation can also lead people that way as well so you know when you look at media and you look at these things you know sometimes people can strategically try and set that up exactly. um, but just again the balance of like seeing say the president, you know, um, Obama, you know, whether people believe in his politics or not, but yet some young man, some young boy, some young woman seeing that, yeah. all of a sudden they could get there. So that's the importance of the visual. Of course, the, the spirit, the energy is, is very important, but the visual is very important just to see yourself in those positions. You see a doctor, you see a teacher, you see a prof you know, professor, those things lead and help energize. Exactly. So I think, again, we're all on that thing. I never seen anything in high school. I never seen anything. I never seen anyone unless they were a slave or any, you know. Exactly. So it took us whatever we all found our way through it to kind of be inspired. And we all have our little stories. But now you can add and, you know, we have kids, uh, you know, and the community learns through entertainment as well. And so now some young kid that's coming up that's eight years old is just doesn't even know that they just know I can do whatever I want because they've seen it. You know, right. yeah. it's nor it's normal to them, you know, so that's very powerful. Okay. Um, as I suspected, this is such a great conversation. I, I don't want to, I'm not stopping it now. You guys are touching on so many interesting things and, and I want to pass it over to David, who's just going to uh, throw a couple questions that we've been having that we've gotten from the audience. Um, that have been listening. Just one quick comment, because Stephanie mentioned this, mentioned, this, mentioned this at the outset. You know, the three of you talking just now about such an important issue, which is sort of, and this touches on what I do as a patron, which is trying to break down some of the barriers that have prevented, um, 
you know, young people, especially from seeing museums and from seeing, um, from going to museums, from seeing themselves in museums, not only on the art on the walls, but the people who work at museums, that's part of a larger conversation happening now. Um, and I think it's so important that you as artists are showing the way that, you know, we didn't, I mean, I didn't grow up looking at art. My parents didn't take me to museums. I sort of had to learn to do that. And, you know, you all too are sort of each in your own way talking about following your passion and following what you believe in and making pictures of the way your lives are, but also the way that life ought to be. I think you're reflecting black, back to the black community and to the world at large, you know, ways of, of living and seeing that don't get shown enough. And I think you're inspiring without even necessarily realizing it, that you're doing that. And on top of it, getting back to what Stephanie said, you're doing this from the standpoint of being a self-taught artist. You know, there was the painting that uh, I think it was um, that uh, Justin showed that had Basquiat in the background, uh, bad, you know, Black American Dreams. I think, you know, the Basquiat was a self-taught artist. Thornton Dial was a self-taught artist. Many are just off the top of my own head. You know, the path of the self-taught artist is that much harder but I think you guys are showing us a way to reach the walls of museums, to reach the viewers, to have an impact through, in spite of the fact that you didn't follow the normal channels um, through, your, through your journey in the art world so far, which I think to each of you is really just beginning. Um, and uh, so let me just, with that, I wanna to toss it to David, who I think wants to relay some of the questions in the chat. Um, is that, is that okay, David? Absolutely. In fact, that was a perfect segue because um, one of the first questions was, can you tell us how you got started as artists? Uh, you know, so uh, Bernard just talked about the, the self-taught aspect, but take us, uh, take us down that journey a little more. Tony. Is this, is this for oh, anybody? Are with me? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my mom will tell you I've just always been a creator and I've always just created. Um, but I thought I would be an actress. I went to the National Conservatory of Dramatic Arts and I, I quit maybe within two months or so. I don't know what happened my whole life. I thought I would be an actress and I just lost interest in it, didn't continue it. Um, at that point, I had to figure out what am I going to do now? How am I going to make money? Um, and so my husband, boyfriend at the time, um, suggested, uh, since I always love creating and um, things like that, to try out photography. And I have not put the camera down since. Um, and so in the beginning, I just kind of was uh, shooting whatever, just using it as a way to make money. Um, and I had my son when I was 25 and immediately, instantly, um, changed to shooting kids. It was amazing fun. Um, I, I'm trying to rush so that I know that <laughs> we have. And so I, um, after photographing him, other people wanted me to photograph their children. Um, from that, I got commercial jobs. Um, and a very big pivotal point for me was um, ooh, photographing my father um, and his battle with cancer, prostate cancer. Um, that pretty much changed everything for me and what I wanted to do with my camera. And those brought about those questions. Um, what am I doing? Uh, uh, you know, you realize you only have a certain amount of time left here in the world. I probably only have 40 years left for me, um, maybe 50. Um, and so I just kind of, um, let go of shooting for monetary gain and just started to focus on um, things that were important to me that were um, that contributed as I said to the world that I wanted my children to grow up in and so I just kind of started um, just putting my frustration into my work and and my love and sadness and all of those things I just started putting them into my work um, shared it and I, I think I was trying to heal myself, didn't realize at the time that it was also healing for other people. Yeah. Um, and so it just kind of was just this natural, organic 
um, thing that happened. And I've been focusing on that ever since. I think that journey is so um, evident in your work. And I, yeah. I, I love that about it. I, I also think that the best work is always highly personal and universal at the same time. Yeah. Your, your work is really doing that. <laughs> uh, Taha, tell us about your, your journey into it. I, I was a sports guy. Um, my siblings and I, we were all sports. That's what it was. But I think it was just more energy, you know, just energy, energy out there. Do, you know, school the structure didn't really work. It's just expression. And maybe if we had known at that age, we could have been into more performing arts or into something at that age, but it was just, it was just sports. And, and then I, I stopped doing it in school, high school. And then, um, you know, you just go the way, your community, your people. And then um, I left the school my, my senior year and I went to a different school and I had to sign up for classes. And I was like, oh, art, I remember I used to like art. And I got into it. And then um, basically I started in my, in my 20s. It was like something after work I would doodle and stuff. And then I was like, okay, let's set a vision. And I talked to a friend that graduated from uh, uh, an academy and a, and a college. And then I was like, okay, this is how you can create. And so I got into it and just really started focusing on it. My brothers did as well. My brother, other brother's a, a leather worker, creates bags and just art with that. My other brother does sculpture, but we all started in our like twenties in that same, within the same like year. So it just kind of went from sports into art. So we were always into sound and into jazz and into all that stuff. It was just part of our culture. Um, but it just kind of went through and we're so passionate and I just have so much stuff that you want to, you know, express. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it just went in, in that way. And I, and again, I work with my hands and so I'm a builder as well. So it's just that kind of creation and really just started pushing it and moved from Toronto to New York, just like, let's go for it. And, uh, and just jumped in and it's kind of evolved and, you know, all that stuff. My wife's an artist, just, we just it just kind of found me or, you know, yeah. chisel, chisel a little way at it. So it, it sounds like you were lucky because you had the, the artist community, even in your family, which is uh, incredible. And, uh, and I have to say on the sports thing, that's not the usual connection for the artists, but the New York Academy of Art manages to field its own soccer team. I feel like hey, the art hey, school that hey, actually has an athletic team on the side. Nice, nice. Uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful. There you go. Uh, Justin, tell us about your journey. Man, so it's, it's kind of cool to hear everybody say something similar, which is that, like, it just, it seems like it almost, like, was in them already, like, genetically. Like, it's so interesting, because uh, my mom, uh, I was raised by my grandma, so my mom is an issue with her, but uh, all my life, they were saying, like, your mom, your mom was an artist, your mom was an artist. So I'm just like, really? Uh, so that explains why when I was a kid, just like looking at cartoons, I would just want to draw a Ninja Turtle like a hundred times on anything, on the walls, whatever, <laughs> anything, you know what I mean? Get, get, get a little spanking after that, but anywhere <laughs> there was a, <laughs> anywhere there was something for me to draw, it was just like, it was calling me to do it. And, uh, and I always just kind of, it was no, nobody taught me. It was like, I remember looking at a Ninja Turtles movie and is it Ninja Turtles is kind of the reason why it took me on this this journey. But it was like a scene where April was drawing one of the Ninja Turtles, and I'm like five, looking like wow, like that's amazing that people can draw like this. So I would get a paper, piece of paper and a pen, and, and try to draw it. And then ever since then, in school, I would uh, try to compete with people on who had, who could draw the best Ninja Turtle. And things like that. It was just like that that culture back in the day of just like uh, competing with each other. Um, but it was friendly competition. Um, sometimes it turned serious, but uh, that just I don't know. That just shows me that there was something in me the whole time that kind of uh, like when you hear the word self taught, it's like not only teaching yourself how to draw, but like yourself is like learning all of these things and like uh, transforming. And uh, uh, that's how I felt like I was doing over the years, just like evolving and transforming. And I don't know how or where, it just seems always like things were like calling me into becoming like 
what I'm doing now. And uh, I'm just I'm just going with the flow. I'm going with the destiny of it all. Love that. Yeah. And I, I love the practical advice there um, for the audience. If you ever need inspiration, go straight to the Ninja Turtle movies. <laughs> what? Love everything. Yeah. Um, right there. Uh, that's where I'm going next time I start a painting. Yes. And okay, Ooh. Pani, here's another one for you. They, you were talking a little bit about uh, the emotions, you bring your children to museums and stuff in these times. Can, can you guys address the emotions uh, that have been a part of the COVID like reality in terms of making art, seeing art, being in the art world, how that's affected you? I want to make sure I understand your question. Can you, can you, can you ask it again? Yeah. Um, you're saying, um, you know, what other emotions, and this is the question specifically, what other emotions have been a part of the COVID exhibition reality for you? Like, have you, oh, you been I... to show as much? Have you gone out? less have you seen less you know just anything that comes up from how that has changed your artistic yeah. life um yeah it's been challenging it's been different i will say i'm i it's hard for me usually to speak i don't know why that that happened with age so it's usually hard for me to sit on panels so i am enjoying being on Zoom because it's a lot easier. If you're, um, if you're frustrated actress um, thing coming out, <laughs> here you go. I don't know what happened, but uh, so I am enjoying that that part of it. Um, yeah, it's different not being able to experience. Um, I, I wasn't able to make it to this exhibition. My daughter has asthma. Um, my mom lives with us as well, and she has a lung issue as well. So I, I haven't been really going out. And so it's been very different to seeing art in person is is so much more amazing than, than having to view it online. So yeah. to me, that's been challenging, not really to be being able to take that in and, and be being able to fully experience um, the overwhelming feeling of exhibitions. I'm always overwhelmed by the work when I'm viewing it. Um, and so that's, for me, been that cha the challenge of that. Yeah, yeah. What about you, Tom? Um, I feel with, okay, just with the times and how everything kind of happened. And again, being in New York and the whole thing just boom and everything shut down and everyone tripping. And, um, there's the positive and negative. The positive was definitely like, I was able to streamline my thoughts. So it wasn't like, you didn't get this done because you quit or you didn't do the right thing. It was like, this is shut down, calm down, let it be. Let it be, it's happened, it is what it is. So I spent a lot of quality time with my kids and it was, it was just kids, it was just energy with that. And then it was, I was able to get a lot of artwork done. I just sat, I painted at home, the studio at home and just kept it kind of this bubble of just clean energy, trying to keep that going, keep the health up, keep all that. Um, now with that said, I know there's a whole nother side to it, which whether it's friends or family and just the environment that I was in was very kind of fragile and very, you know, sick and just dark and that. So um, it was maneuvering within that, but keeping the base clean and healthy and keep the mind fresh, keeping the mind right. And um, I was able to go out to the show I did. I went with the family, we went out there and um, it was just, it was one of those things of connecting with the family more. Even though I was, we were always still very connected, but it was, my daughter learned how to ride her bike, roller skate. It was like just me and her or my kids, my wife, and then, so I use it more as a, like a cleansing time and just put the energy into the art and then put the energy into the family and everything else. I can't change it. This is New York. It's going to exist around you and you just don't even, right. don't even try and keep up, but, but listen and don't like be naive and not, you know, ignorant to whatever. But, uh, so I definitely took it as definitely, uh, you know, build that shield, that force field of just health and energy and, and, just kind of went, went at it. And there's ups and downs, don't get me wrong, but that's the main mindset yeah. was just like, you know, keep moving. Just the sage shield, right, Tom? Yo, just I'm thinking of, yeah. 
I'm going to get some sage. Yeah, Justin, we'll let, we'll let Justin, you weigh in here. Yeah. Hey, uh, could you repeat the question one more time? Just it, so I can... about how like the the COVID situation affected you and, and your kind of you know journey in the art world. Of, like, were you going out as much, seeing exhibitions as much? Were you you know staying in? Like, how how, how did that all work for you? It's so it's so crazy because the end of 2019, I was on I was embarking on that self portrait uh, that you they showed, I believe, uh, and that that happened around like November. So I was already like planning on um, taking a few months of self quarantining to finish this painting, and this was this was late 2019. So you know I'm painting it, and uh, February came around. I'm almost done, and I believe this. You know Kobe Bryant had passed, and then it was just like the year didn't quite start off like how everybody expected it to start off. You know in 2019, everybody's like. 2020 is my year, all of this. Uh, and so it started off bad. And then I'm painting this thing, I'm in a house and basically uh, March came and I'm almost finished. And this is when the whole COVID thing started to get real serious. And I'm just like, like what's going on? And um, the crazy part as well is that uh, it's, uh, these guys are like filming a documentary on like my story or whatever you want to say. And that happened right when the shutdown happened. So we're like, what's going on here? Like, is the world about to end? Like, you know, I'm just finishing this painting. I was planning on having like an art show uh, and all of this. And this, the, the world got locked down. So like at first I was self quarantining on purpose. And then it, now I'm in the house, uh, you know, not, you know, not by my own choice. And that kind of right. like made me feel funny. You know what I mean? It's like, I, I, I was already slaving away basically with this painting and I couldn't wait to get out. But I used that time to say like, what happens if the world doesn't end and, uh, you know, um, things like that. So I just decided to paint another painting along that time and still still do it but I, used, I guess you would say i used it wisely um uh and i would say like amongst the black community black urban community i i, I said this before i believe that we've been in a pandemic for forever <laughs> it seems like like it, left and right people are getting killed on camera uh you know being treated unjust and things like that so we are we already have a high stress level as it is in any year <laughs> so it's almost like that kind of made a lot of people not freak out as much as the whole world freaked out yeah. and you know i i uh so basically i guess i'll say as 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 much as it is a tragic year um just being prepared from all the times I sat in front of paintings and things like that it almost seemed like I've seen all this before already it's, it's, it's strange yeah, yeah, yeah. Bernard will <laughs> you answer before. that question too because you actually wrote an essay basically about about <laughs> for the show and uh maybe that's the way to wrap this up it's a perfect ending and we are um over time which I have totally not minded at all because this conversation <laughs> has been so incredibly great and by the way i just want to say i'm so glad it's been recorded because i want the whole world to see it i really do <sighs> so bernard uh, that bring us home here and tell us about the what you're what you were talking about in your essay which really addresses this question sure no first again um <clears throat> thanks to, to each of you now i just want to meet meet you in person and look at more of your work and talk talk about the work live and um, I hope we can get to that. Uh, so uh, th I hope this conversation is just the beginning and um, I appreciate, you know, sort of the journey that each of you has taken us through tonight, you know, in the work and I referenced already in terms of how you are sort of just by being here, by being present, by showing up, by sharing, um, you're sort of showing to our audience and to whoever else will see this after this evening that uh, there is a way to have a voice and a vision in the art world um, and to have an impact. Um, I, just, I really hope that you, you take that away from this conversation. Um, 
and David and I can talk more about that with you guys afterward. Um, you know, what Justin was saying now was so interesting. I was smiling because, you know, it's true that for many artists, social distancing is kind of a way of life. Um, you know, I mean, artists are trained to, to be in their studio, to, to make work, to, you know, um, somewhat lead solitary lives. And, you know, I think not every artist has to do that, but Justin, the, the sort of paradigm that you set up at the end of 2019, you were locked down, you were on lockdown, <laughs> finishing a painting, and then you went into a different kind of lockdown, you know, from voluntary lockdown to involuntary lockdown. What I wrote about for the, yes, for the exhibition was my conversations with artists and sort of the journey in my conversations with artists from the beginning of the pandemic until, um, you know, the, uh, the George Floyd induced protests. Um, I think that, you know, early on, my conversations were focused mo mostly, mostly with artists who were in their studios, like you, Justin, making work. Um, the pandemic was, you know, made it safer to be in your studio. It was the civic thing to do. It was the create, it was, you know, positive for cre positivity for creative um, art making, being alone, being separated, being isolated, thinking about, you know, in a, being in a room where you, you're just your own voice and your own vision. And then an interesting thing happened in my conversations with artists um, on May 25th, which was when George Floyd began to sort of knock on the studio walls or the response to what happened with George Floyd. And sort of, you know, not that it was the first time that these voices and these um, protests were happening. It was just the first time that I think, you know, a bigger part of the country and the world took notice and participated. And so there was a shift in my conversations with artists from, you know, what are you making inside the studio? What are you thinking of? What are your thoughts in terms of how your work fits into the greater evolution of the work that you've made in the past and where you see it going in the future? There was a distinct shift from that to conversations about how can I get outside of my studio? How can I engage with other people? How can I connect with my fellow artists? How can I have a voice that goes beyond the painting or the sculpture or the photograph that I'm working on and that touches on the issues that are bringing people into the streets? And I thought for me, you know, as a father, again, you know, fatherhood is something we talked about tonight and parenthood for each of us, I think, is something uh, which informs our work, whether you're an artist or a patron. Uh, I think that, you know, I took the example of the artists that I was speaking with, like, you three tonight and I realized that I had an opportunity here to teach my own children you know a very real-time civics lesson and so I took them out and we went to some family-friendly marches and it was one of my first sort of re-engagements with the world after the pandemic um, and you know I think for me it was really you know another example of the ways in which you know we need to listen to artists uh, even when it's painful, even when the work, it makes us feel uncomfortable, even when the work is showing us things that we uh, feel shame about, or we feel anger about, or we feel pain about, that I think, you know, each of you, Justin, Tani, and Taha, are sort of bravely sort of paving the way for generations that will come after you, and for lessons that will be taught, that you are passing down, that will be learned and will be valuable. So for the next, so that the next time there's another pandemic, and as Justin, you said so correctly, uh, this was not the first pandemic. There have been other pandemics and there will be other pandemics. And I feel that what you've done tonight is sort of remind us that um, we can have strength even in adversity and you can have a voice even when um, you don't have an exhibition or a show or an outlet for the voice and we normally expect in the art world. So thank you for inspiring me. I think, thank you. I'm sure uh, people listening on, watching, listening tonight uh, will take some of this away. And um, yeah, Dave, that, that's, um, that's the, uh, my last- perfect, uh, It's a perfect note to end it on. Yeah. <laughs> thank you to the audience for staying with us and, and Tony, Justin, Taha, this was great. Thank you so much, Bernard. Yeah. Stephanie, I'll see you soon. Bye, everybody. Nice. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Until next time. Until yeah. next time.